Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Tonight, we are going to be talking about what you should be doing right now for each stage of kidney disease. And to help guide us and give us the best, greatest information, I have here with me as my co-host, the author of what I I tell you guys, is the best book, the number one book for learning about kidney disease. And this is the book that I wish doctors would hand out when diagnosed. It is the author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. This book makes it easy to understand what you need to know, what you need to focus on, what you don't need to worry about, because there's so much that we worry about that we really don't need to worry about. That's all talked about in this book. And I am talking about the author of this, Dr. Stephen Rosansky. Hey, Doc. Hey, James. Good evening. Good evening to you and good evening to all your dad vice viewers. And uh, we'll call me Not to Worry Doc. And there we go. Not to couple. Worry Doc. I love it. <laughs> Most docs will give you stuff to worry about. I mean, I'm realistic, but I hopefully will give you stuff that you don't need to worry about. And we'll get into a lot of that uh, tonight. Um, do you do you want me to give my background? I guess. Yeah, uh, give your background because we <laughs> always get new people, and I figured right. we you always have time for Q and A. So I right. zoomed through my stuff to give you the most time possible tonight. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I am a retired kidney specialist. I spent over 40 years taking care of kidney patients. I started the kidney program in Columbia, South Carolina at the VA in Columbia. I started the program for the, uh, for the med school as well. And I've done a lot of research and I published a good bit, uh, over 100 publications. And I've done a lot of work on the issue and have been recognized for my work of when you should start dialysis, which uh, unfortunately, as we'll discuss tonight, is still occurring way too early in patients with much too much kidney function remaining. Uh, and I've also uh, written a good bit about uh, what determines whether your kidneys are going to decline in function. And as a matter of fact, I uh, just reviewed a paper for a major journal <coughs> about that issue. Uh, so I'm still in the game, even though I'm retired. And I wrote the book that James showed you to get you folks who I know worry about your kidney problem and your stage of kidney disease. And I've been having people talk to me about their stage of kidney disease for several decades. And, um, and, and knowing that too many people are getting started uh, on dialysis unnecessarily, I figured I would go directly to, to you folks. So I wrote a book uh, for you in your language that hopefully uh, you can uh, stop worrying so much and, and learn how to manage your, your kidney problem. So we should dig in because I know James would like to answer, get some of your questions answered. And I apologize. I've got a little frog in my throat. <clears throat> I'll try not to <laughs> try to clear it and blow everybody away because I know that would not be nice. But I do have a little getting a little laryngitis. Um, James, are these stages magical? Where the heck did they come from? Did you make them up, James? Can we blame you? Any idea where they come from? You would think I made them up, <laughs> and they're not magical. And I've learned they really don't mean anything. I focus on symptoms, my blood pressure, other labs, results that may be out of whack, and how I feel. So... You know how it all got started? It all got started with the thing that that James has learned to love to hate is the EGFR, your kidney number, your estimated glomerular filtration rate. When that came on in the early 2000s, a bunch of us docs got together and said, hey, we want to improve your outcomes for you folks with kidney disease. We want to diagnose it early and we want to get get people on board to make sure that we uh, do whatever we can do to keep you from having to go on a machine. That was a good, good intentions. Yep. And as James knows, well, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And this is another example of that. 
good intentions gone wild. Uh, so the first thing to do, and what I'm going to talk about initially, is what all of you folks, no matter what your stage, what you should be doing for all stages of real CKD. Now, James, why do I call real CKD as opposed to fake CKD? <laughs> I'm going to guess you're talking about when you have a, an EGFR below 60 and protein in your urine, something like that that shows that you actually do have some kidney issues. Is that right? That, that's going extreme. That's not even going extreme. That's, that's going a few steps beyond uh, the initial step. The first step is when you get your kidney number and when you're going to be evaluated for your stage, you need to be stable. And James right here, right in front of you, when, almost got stuck on a kidney machine because he had something called AKI, meaning your kidneys got crapped out short term yep. and there's no uh, reason to check your kidney function unless you're in a stable state. And what are some of the things that will cause the kidney function <clears throat> to go from a stage three to a stage five and really you're just at a stage three, like what? Dehydration. Yes, absolutely. If you get sick and you get dehydrated, that, that number is useless. And then there's all kinds of other things that people do. They take various drugs, like the drugs we talk about all the time, the ACEs, the ARBs, the SGLT2s, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the Motrim. I mean, these things are, and low blood pressure. Th these things together will cause so many people to panic about my stage four or stage five CKD when they either have no CKD or they're really stage three. So you got to be stable before that number means a darn thing. Okay. And the other thing that we've talked about many, many times is what James, in terms of individual values, what, what should be, what should you folks be focusing on with CKD? Blood pressure. One, no, the, the values of your, of your GFR. You should focus on the, the trend. values, the trend, the trend, yes. not an one individual number. One value is meaningless. You need the trend. And if your if your data point, your GFR that you got this today at your doctor's office is way higher than normal, repeat it, repeat it. And we'll talk about what happens when you repeat it uh, in a minute. Everybody uh, with CKD should be on a relatively low protein plant-based diet and no panicking over potassium you don't need to worry about potassium for the vast majority of you until you get into at least stage four or five so plant-based diet relatively low protein and what do i mean by <clears throat> relatively low protein in this country we're taking in roughly, James, you know how much protein, how many grams of protein the average good American eats a day? I'm going to go out and guess close to 100 grams. 120. 120. <laughs> That's still a lot more than even 100. That's 20% and, and, higher. And, and, and relatively low is 60 to 80. And we're going to get into uh, the, okay, we'll get into it right now. What about very low protein? Uh, James, so rel okay. So if you're 200 pounds, which a lot of us are, uh, a, uh, a relatively low protein is about 80 grams, a lot less than your 120 or 100 to 120. So relatively low protein. Don't go crazy. Relatively low protein. Why does the extremely low protein not make sense? Do you know the well, reason for that, James? Well, if you're diabetic, that could be a huge problem and even dangerous. Because if you're getting rid of protein and you're not eating carbohydrates, you're going to crash. Your, your, your blood sugars are going to crash. You got to have protein. And, and there's no, okay, what else? I can't think of anything. Okay, else. okay. So there's a couple of big reasons. You know, first of all, I've reviewed the literature on low protein diets. So one of the reasons why I bring this up is that uh, I've got a someone who's written a book who's not a physician who promotes low protein diets, also sells protein supplements, which are ex <laughs> expensive and totally unnecessary and dangerous, dangerous diabetics, extremely dangerous, even non diabetics. 
And the studies that were done on low protein were not convincing. And if anything, there's potentially harm that they've shown long term with very low protein. But the other reason is that I've gone on the show with James in the last year talking about these wonderful drugs you have that really work to slow kidney disease. You've got, we've got like five classes of drugs. You've got three new classes of drugs that were not around that have been proven to slow decline of kidney disease. So you got to, you got to use what works. So the research now is you got to throw it away because they, it wasn't standard of care to use these drugs that we know that slow decline of kidney disease. And very low protein is horrible, tasteless. Your quality of life will be affected. No reason. Avoid it. Avoid it. Okay. Now, what do you avoid in your diet? What specific thing would you tell people in general to avoid? Now, you want relatively low protein. What should they avoid? If you want low protein? <laughs> no, no. Uh, what particular type of protein? has been shown to maybe be the worst animal protein, especially yeah, red, red meat. meat, red meat, James, you're on it, red meat. And, and there's just an association is associated with a higher risk of progression, relatively low protein and very high protein diets, which is our normal diet. 120 plus can also increase your risk of progression. So James, what are the two? The main factors that, and again, this is for all stages, that put you at a higher risk of going on to dialysis. The two things that you're, two, level of what two things? Proteinuria, which is the protein in your urine. <laughs> and specifically, we talk about, since we're educated, and James and I have tried to educate you folks, and I try to educate James, it's the urine test of protein, and it's called the what? Do you remember? What do they measure in the lab? Darn it. And you all I, should be familiar with this. We just you know, talked you, about this in the last right. time. That, that's fine. That's fine, James. I, you all know you get urine dipsticks and you've seen urine dipsticks. You get one plus and two plus and trace. But it's the urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Okay. That is the key thing. And your, your kidney number, your EGFR. The lower the EGFR and the higher the uh, albumin to creatinine ratio, the higher your risk. That's the bottom line. Generally speaking, if you're one of the lucky folks who has real CKD, which we're going to define in a minute, uh, but your urine protein is, is not significant, which means in the U.S. under 30, that test, if you're out of the U.S., it's under 3 because you use different units. Uh, the, uh, the range of protein less than 30 or less than three, you're normal, very low risk. Uh, and, uh, the range of protein of low levels is 30 to 300. Once you get over two, 300 on that test, the albumin and creatinine, that's significant. Okay. And that would be, um, <clears throat> once you get over outside the U S 20 to 30, uh, that's significant. Now, the low levels of protein in the urine, again, don't fret over them because they're going to vary a lot. If you've got, you know, 30, 40 uh, in the U.S. or 50, uh, and, and you know, next time you go in, you may not have any. It can vary a lot by fever, by exercise, so don't get hung up on it. But if you're consistently running in the 2-300 range in the U.S. or 2 to, uh, or 20 to 30 outside the U.S., you've got, you got really significant protein. So, uh, in the early stages, uh, what's the most critical thing that people are, need to be concerned about, which we talk about just about every show in the early stages, one, two, and three. Is that blood pressure? Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's part of the, um, problem. It's your, the word that you love to hate. Heart disease. <laughs> cardiovascular disease. And I'm going to break it down. Arteriosclerotic is hardening of the arteries and the hardening of the arteries problems that are more common if you've got kidney uh, disease stage three and on 
especially are things like heart failure, strokes, uh, TIAs means you have some transient neurological problem, heart attacks, bypass. Those are the things that you got to worry about. And the risk will really start going up when you get to uh, uh, EGFR 45 to 60. Not so much if you're older, as we'll get to, but younger folks, if you've just got no protein, but you're 45 to 60, you've got to do everything you can to get on the healthy behaviors, and James has been all about that. He's all over that. You want to decrease your risk of dying from this, the, the hardening of the arteries. Now, let's get right into the stages. And James was telling me last night, so many people uh, were talking about having stage one and stage two. What, first of all, stage one is normal. There is no such thing as stage one, and so they should throw it out, absolutely. Stage one is normal or high function. It means you got over 90 on the number. <laughs> so it's not CKD, unless what? Protein in the Ooh. urine, significant. You got it, you got it. Significant protein in the urine, okay? So there's no such thing as stage one unless you got significant protein in the urine. And as James said earlier, you can't be diagnosed with one value. You gotta get your test done twice, okay? And, and, and as we've said here on the show, if, and I just talked to James about it, if you want to know at home what your urine protein is doing, get on Amazon, get urine dipsticks, and you can yep. measure your own urine protein. If you've got one plus on that dipstick consistently, you've got serious protein. So you can, make a, you can do a quick screen of that on your own. Um, and the reason why you send that your doctor should be sending a specimen of urine, small, tiny specimen to the lab to get that albumin measured and the creatinine measured is that that will not depend on how much urine you're making, whether you're taking a diuretic or how concentrated the urine is, but your urine dipstick, as James knows, will be strongly influenced by if you're really dehydrated. If you're really dehydrated, uh, you may only be putting out half a liter. So if one plus is 300 per liter, that would be 150 milligrams. It's still significant, as we said, okay? You get, you get close to 200, that's definitely serious. Now, stage two is called mildly decreased. <laughs> and and it's, 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 it's pretty much thrown out, as we'll talk to you in a minute. And the number there for stage two is 60 to 89. And in general, most labs have determined that these values above 60 are not reliable. But if you happen to have a 6 to 89, if you've got, you don't have kidney disease unless you've got the protein in the urine. Um, and take a guess, if you randomly check people uh, for protein, and, and who's, how often do you find significant protein? I'm going to guess it's pretty low. Yeah, one out of 20. <laughs> so most of you are not going to have significant protein. And I like the UK guideline. Let me tell you, the UK and Australia, New Zealand, if you're in one of those two countries, I think my opinion is you're better off because you're not going to be put on dialysis too early uh, in most cases. They don't put you on dialysis early. We'll get to that later. But in the UK, they say to even consider you to have kidney disease. If your GFR is over 60, they want that urine protein to be over 300. And I think that makes sense. If it's over 300 uh, or over 30 outside the US, that's, that's, that's kidney disease with stage one or two. Otherwise, one or two, throw it out. Ignore it unless you've got over 300, over 200 in that albumin and the creatinine ratio. Throw it out. Stop worrying about it. Get rid of it. Not to worry. Okay, that's got a lot of you folks out there. All right, any questions before we get to stage three, uh, James? No, hey, we got <laughs> lots of comments. People are loving what you're talking about, and you're answering a lot of the questions as, you know, as you're okay. talking that are coming up. But we'll have time. But we're going to have a lot of questions later. Okay, well, we'll hopefully have time. Okay, stage three is called, uh, mod okay, 
uh, stage three is moderately decreased. Okay. And the range of stage three is why it's 30 to 59. Okay. Now, uh, James was mentioning earlier, <laughs> Jen was on, Jen's a dietitian. I haven't met her, but I'm, I'm sure she's a, a quality individual. But those of you who have stage three to five, not a bad idea to get nutritional counseling. I, I will say that. Okay. Um, but there's no need for restrictive diets at all when you're on in stage three. Very rare that any stage three person should be on a really restrictive diet. And another thing that we've gone over, and you may have the answer here, James, if you got stage three, how often does a stage three per person go on a dialysis? Out very, of very sl rare. At, very out, rare. Of out of 100 people. Okay, I'm trying to remember, was it? It's less than 5%, right? One out of 100, maybe. There we go. One out of 100. Very so rare. So I was right. Very, very <laughs> rare. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> now, if you happen to be 75 range, which is my age range, uh, you need to have less than 45 or 50 measured twice again, if you're like in the 75 age range, to call yourself having kidney disease that you need to be concerned about is 45 to 50 repeated twice in, in an interval of uh, three months. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea that they've divided up um, these 3A to two pieces. This uh, 3A, the uh, 3A and 3B, stage 3A and B. I mean, why is this? reasonable because half of all CKD is in 3A, 45 to 60. That's most of you folks listen, li listening out there. And, um, and, and many, many of you uh, may not have CKD, again, if you're an older folk. Um, <clears throat> let's say that you have a 45 to 59, 45 to 60 EGFR. How often and, and, I, and I say, you got to get a check because you're going to repeat it and come back in three months, repeat it. How often do you think uh, it will be normal? Oh, when they reject it? it's going to be a high number. It's one out of three. So don't accept one value, get panicky, go back to your doctor in three months. If it's still in that 45 to 60 range, well, okay, you got CKD. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, now, if you have, uh, oh yeah, okay, so this is something else that I, I just learned this, uh, this week. Looking at a random sample of people, all the various stages, checking everybody, their EGFR and urine protein. So about 95% of people are going to have a EGFR in the one to, one to two stage range. That's most people. And... Uh, having a 3A is only about 4% of people, and having 3B is only about 1%. So it's going to be pretty unusual, and we've got so many people getting uh, one lab test to worry about it, but most of you, you repeat it, it's not going to be abnormal. You're not going to have CKD. Uh, and, uh, all right, so in Australia, New Zealand, and I like these guidelines. I tell you, I like UK and I like Australia, New Zealand. They say if you're over 70, which a lot of you folks are, and you have your urine albumin and creatinine is normal, which would be less than 30 in the U.S., less than three outside the U.S., um, and your GFR is over 45 consistently, you do not have CKD. And I like the Australia, New Zealand guideline. Okay. Well, what do you do if you happen to be? So depending upon your age, managing this CKD stage will, will differ. Uh, what if you're an older folk and you got stage three? Um, some, one of the things that you should be doing is getting rid of a lot of medicines, deep prescribing. We're on way too many medicines. And some of these medicines are going to do more harm than good. For example, James, can you give me an example of when some of these medicines may be more harmful than good. I was not paying attention. I'm That's okay. An, an older person, I know, it's all right. An older person, 
uh, certain medicines can do more harm than good. Like over-treating blood pressure, over-treating diabetes. Happens all the time. Low blood sugar will kill you, especially if you're older. A1C, 8 is all you should be shooting for. <clears throat> blood pressure, you try to get 110, 120, you may overdo it. Drop your blood pressure, you may have falls, you may pass out, you may have a car accident. 130 to 140 if you're older on your blood pressure. A1C of about 8, okay? And try to get rid of those CNS sedated meds. They'll increase your falls, so try to get rid of those. A lot of people, especially older folks, are prescribed these um, uh, benzos. Now, if you're a younger person, by all means, go for an A1C less than 7. Go for a blood pressure less than 120. But that's depending on your age. So now let's get into 3B, okay? The, I like 3B because that's everybody with 3B, which is 30 to 45. If you're in that range, consistently repeat it over three months, you got CKD. That's when you got CKD. 3B is CKD, 30 to 45. Uh, and your risk of having the atherosclerotic problems goes up significantly. Uh, <clears throat> and when you get to that, if, if you are, you know, in that range, 30 to 45, all of the things that you do, lifestyle things, uh, will have a major effect on helping you live longer. So if you can exercise 30 minutes, five times a week, That'll help your blood pressure, your glucose, your cholesterol, your stress level. I mean, exercise to me is, 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 is a great thing for all of you. Stopping cigarettes, the number one cause of preventable death, and you can slow your decline of kidney function. So if you, especially when you get to 3B, uh, all of the lifestyle things will have a major, major benefit for you living longer. Now, <clears throat> stage four, uh, is 15 to 29, and that's CKD, if you that, have that consistently. And you know what's interesting, James? When this stage just first came out, we were bombarded with consults because no one knew what to do with stage one, two, and three. Yeah. You know, yeah. What, you know what the nephrology community has decided? Unless you're stage four or five, don't bother to send a consult to a kidney specialist. You got to start thinking about seeing the kidney specialist when you get to stage four, below 30. Now, that is unless you've got significant protein, then you got to see them early on. If you got significant protein, by all means, see the kidney doc, even if you got higher or normal levels of GFR. Um, and so by the time you're stage four, that's when, and everybody said, well, do, am I going to get symptoms from my kidneys? Am I going to get kidney pain? No pain. It's painless. Um, Will I get complications from kidney? No, don't expect to have anything wrong until you get to stage four. And stage four is when you start getting anemia, which is easily treated, when you may have trouble with potassium and you may have trouble with your fluids, but not before that for most people. <clears throat> um, and if you're a younger person and uh, you're a stage uh, for, uh, you definitely want to get on the transplant list. You can get on that list at 20, okay, EGFR. And, and the longer you're on the list, the more time you accumulate, the quicker you may get a transplant. And if you are in stage four, you want to save the veins in your non-dominant arm in case they want to put an access in to go on dialysis. What is the non-dominant arm, James, you know? That's, if you're right-handed, that's your left. Right, save it. You, so that's where they would uh, put the, the fistula in. Now, um, if you're an older person, I wouldn't be as uh, excited to get that access done because for two reasons. One, your kidney function decline is slower than the younger person. And so many people, like the guy in my book, I call Mr. Smith, had four operations. He was a 
a 90 year old person had four operations on his arms, upper and lower arms that he didn't need. He never used, never used the access. A lot of older folks will never get to use it. Now, what about the dietary protein? If you're stage four or five, should you be on lower protein or higher protein? James probably doesn't know the answer to this one. So I don't think we've talked about it. So for four, I'm going to guess lower. And once you go on dialysis, they'll have you on a higher protein. That's an interesting thought. I think that the second part is right. When you get on dialysis, but actually it's even for stage four. Because what we've learned is that malnutrition starts going up in people as their stage of kidney disease advances. So you probably want to go from a 60 to 80 gram roughly protein, relatively low, to maybe 80 to 100. So you don't want to be on restrictive diets uh, unnecessarily. And uh, in the UK, uh, they, that's what they recommend. They recommend uh, getting to, to be about uh, 80 gram protein diet. Or, or if you're 200 pounds or 100 gram protein uh, with CKD45. And again, we talked about why the very low protein makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Um, now, let's get into stage. Uh, with the other thing, what about dialysis in stage four? Oh. Stage four, 15 no. or 30. <laughs> Big old. Uh. Well, James, you are 100% right. And anybody listening tonight who has got stage four, again, 15 to 30, and if your doctor's suggesting putting you on dialysis, do not let the doctor put you on dialysis. Do not let your doctor put you on dialysis until, please, read my book. Let your doctor read my book. And if you both agree that it's the right thing for you when your GFR is over 15, God bless you and your doctor. But that's going to be unusual. And unfortunately, way too many people get started on dialysis way too early. Okay. I I, I read, here's a quick story. When I first started making these videos, which I'm coming up on my five year mark, there was, I remember a guy in the comments arguing that there's no way I wasn't on dialysis because as soon as you hit 15 you have to go on dialysis and I tried to I tried to educate him and, and ask questions and it turns out his doctor put him on dialysis just before 15 and he thought that's what you had to do he didn't realize that's old school thinking. That's the data shows it's not the right thing. Well, James, part of what you're talking about is exactly my next comment. Stage five, they give this really bad description. They call it kidney failure, which is which gives anybody who's told you got kidney failure. Well, that means I need a transplant or I need dialysis. And the doctors have an excuse because we came up with these stages and stage five is called kidney failure. Well, what does that mean? Let's put everybody on dialysis. James, you have no idea how I've been fighting this tooth and nail. And at least we're putting fewer. I mean, when I started doing my research and I've got a lot of publications on this and my research has been highly regarded one of my papers was the number one game changer in my field. So I think I know my stuff. And, uh, you know, they were putting so many older folks on with fit over 50, over 15. I mean, it's like, I mean, anyway, let's, so don't do it. Don't let anybody else do it unless they come up with a good reason. All right. Now, uh, <clears throat> I know just as an aside, when I looked at the, um, the table of all the stages. As you get into stage four and five, most people who get there are going to have protein in the urine, which just goes to show you that the people that are going to have serious complications needing dialysis or transplant 
are almost inevitably going to have significant protein in the urine. Mm -hmm. So if you got a EGFR in the stage three without protein in the urine, highly unlikely that dialysis will be in your future. Not impossible, but unlikely. Now, when you're at stage five, uh, and you're certainly, uh, if you're a younger person, please read my book. I go into all of the various types of dialysis. And there are many different types. My general recommendation, and we're not going to get into detail tonight, is if it were me, I would go on home peritoneal dialysis, which is the dialysis goes through your belly that you do it at home while you sleep. <clears throat> if you're a younger person, for sure, you want to get on the transplant list uh, when your GFR is 20 or less, and you want to start lining up any related or unrelated donors. An unrelated donor, the outcome is just as good as a related donor. It doesn't have to be a relative. It could be a wife. It could be your spouse or husband. Um, and what is done probably too frequently is, and this is another long discussion, which is not relevant to most people listening, but in younger folks, they preemptively will give you a kidney transplant at high levels of kidney function. I personally don't agree with that, but that's 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 a sophisticated conversation. And, and when you say high levels, are you talking like... I mean 15. I mean 15. Okay, so my research and other colleagues have defined early start over 10 on your EGFR, okay? Uh, and I looked this up. I, I was telling James earlier. Uh, my daughter's a, a geri geriatric doc, and she had me listen to a Grand Rounds <clears throat> this past week uh, about managing older folks uh, with kidney problems. And, uh, and I, I told my daughter, someone should ask about putting people on dialysis early. And, and, and the person to give the talk said, yeah, we know you're not supposed to do it early. Well, I went ahead and looked at the U.S. data. And to my chagrin, my disappointment, we're still putting 40% of people that are older folks in the 70 plus range are getting started early. Four out of 10, over 10, we're still doing it. And very, very few are starting where my research says it's everything else being equal because a lot of things that go into this decision, uh, less than five, okay? So, uh, uh, unless there's a life-threatening uh, reason. <clears throat> and in general, uh, especially older folks with CKD5, notice I say younger people, if you're younger, I'm not as concerned because you're probably going to need dialysis anyway. But older folks, if you, if you keep away from the nephrologist and the machine, you may never... You may never live long enough, realistically, to need the machine. So exactly, um, yeah. So and then then um, they're doing all that reduction in quality of life for no reason. Yeah, if they didn't need it. Yeah, happens all the time, and I could tell you stories all night about patients that have that's happened to. Um, but in general, and and here's a here's a, a very reasonable approach. Your doctor was pushing your dialysis. Hey, doc, why don't we try? non-dialysis therapy before we agree that something has to be done with the machine. What is non-dialysis therapy or conservative therapy? Great treatment for your anemia, great treatment for your fluid problems, uh, uh, great treatment for elevated potassium. So the things that, um, that people may be starting dialysis for, by and large, we could treat them medically. If this fails, if you can't breathe because you can't get rid of the fluids, uh, and you're having, you know, terrible problems with potassium that you can't control. That's another story. <clears throat> um, most of you are starting who do start without a really good reason. Most docs are putting you on because your kidney number is that magic number of 15 or 10, and they just start pushing dialysis. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of folks like James when he had that AKI, he had that, he was hospitalized and they wanted to put him on dialysis, kidney function crashed, but got better. 
when they treated him appropriately with fluids and so forth. But you may get in the hospital, um, and <clears throat> in general, if you are older and you've got heart trouble, you've got other, other major medical problems, you're probably going to live longer without going on the machine. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, and a lot of all the, and James was talking about this earlier. Um, you think that you're going to feel better on dialysis? Well, you may have a honeymoon period because there's probably a placebo effect and you're probably happy. Oh, well, now I don't have to worry about my kidneys. I'm on a kidney machine. But guess what? A lot of people stop dialysis because life on a kidney machine is not fun. It's not fun. If you have to have it, by all means, it could save your life. And a lot of older folks are going to spend the last weeks or months of their life in the ICU or in the hospital. So try to manage with conservative therapy, especially if you're uh, older and, uh, and say no, so just say no to early start of dialysis. Um, and, and, and all of you need something called an advanced directive. You know what that is, James? Yep. That's pretty much here's what to do. Here's what my wishes are and who can make decisions for you if you can't make them. What to do if your heart stop, what to do if you're in an ICU and the doctor says he wants to put you on dialysis, tell, tell your family what you want. Um, and as I said, if you're lucky enough, and I consider it lucky, to be living in the UK or, or New Zealand, Australia, <clears throat> they have lower rates, especially for over uh, 75 folks, and it's going to be to your advantage. Now, if you are a younger person uh, and you're CKD5, you really want to get your, your, your dialysis access early. Uh, and, 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 the, and you can do it at, at stage five. Anytime in stage five, younger folk, get your veins mapped and see what, if you've got a good vein. If you've got a good vein, I'd get that fistula done early. If you're an older person, not, not at all. I would not be <clears throat> pushing to get the access until you're getting ready to start dialysis. And then, you know, some of you may be better off just getting that catheter push comes to shove. You can put a catheter in the neck and use that for dialysis and then do the operation on your arm. And because as we said earlier, so many older folks get these things put in their arms and they never get to use them. Um, and if you, you look at it at my book, there, I, there's actually a way to calculate the theoretical uh, survival once you start dialysis, plug in some numbers, you can go over that with your doc. And um, if you are a younger person in general, you could probably delay dialysis till you're less than five if you're healthy, young, otherwise healthy, and delay it until you get a working fistula. Because putting those catheters in, in an older person, not not as bad an idea, but in a younger person, you, you're worrying about getting an infected catheter. So you want to wait till your, your thing in your arm is ready, and then you could dialyze safer without worrying about those infections. So that covers some ground, and we can answer some questions, James. All right, Doc, there are lots and lots and lots of questions. Um, I want to bring up Valsa, she said, or asked, what's an abnormal albumin-creatinine ratio? Okay. So uh, when you get the number, uh, as I said, in, in the U.S., the, no the uh, normal range is below 30. If you're outside of the U.S., they use different units just to confuse you. So that would be below 3. But a, and that roughly is the amount of, milligrams in 24 hours that you're putting out uh, in your urine. Um, and once you get over two to 300, uh, that, that number gets, that gets to be significant, certainly over 300. All right. And every show, I always have someone ask this question and I've never asked it to you. Is fasting <clears throat> good for CKD? There's a lot of interest in fasting. No. No, no. Ketogenic diets, unnecessary. GLP-1 drugs are great for weight loss. They've revolutionized the treatment for obesity. Uh, no need for ketogenic diets. 
uh, other than kids with seizures, which I think is definitely a, a indication there. Uh, but you, but with kidney disease, you there's a trend to get acidosis, and keto, ketogenic diet will give you more acidosis. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. All right. On the other on, on the other hand, James, just to finish, mm -hmm. um, dealing with lifestyle issues again. For the majority of you, you're stage three. You're not worrying about the vast majority of you ever going on dialysis or needing a kidney transplant. But as your kidney function gets lower, your risk of getting one of those things like a heart attack or a stroke, et cetera, goes up. So, you know, being on a reasonable diet and having a reasonable weight will help with your lifespan. Very good. What are some of the reasons for kidney scarring? Um, well, most of the time when they do a, uh, they do something called an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. An ultrasound is one of the initial parts of the evaluation. Uh, and it'll show you the size of the kidneys. And if you got real small kidneys, that generally means you've had kidney disease for a long time. Um, and they sometimes will see scars. By and large, they're meaningless. There are rare occasions when somebody will have, like you can have a stroke, decreased blood to the brain, you, you can have a kidney stroke, but that's very rare. So the scars are pretty much irrelevant. All right, and Pedro asks, do kidney stones affect the protein in your urine? They should not. They should not. People with kidney stones get something called interstitial nephritis. What is that? It's a big word, meaning the, you have the glomeruli, right, which is the functioning units of the kidney. You've got a couple million of those, and those are the ones that filter the blood. And then around the glomeruli is this fibrous tissue. And when you get infections or you get kidney stones, which can lead to infections, it can affect the parts of the kidney that are not the glomeruli, okay? Glomerular filtration rate, glomeruli, that's what's filtering the blood. When those glomeruli get damaged, that's when you start getting protein in the urine. So by and large, kidney stones, infections are generally not uh, diseases that go with a lot of protein. Very good. And Nancy asked, is getting a transplant at EGFR of 18 too early? I, well, that's, again, um, I have to say that my personal bias is that we have been transplanting people unnecessarily early, okay? Now, if you are a, a young child and you still haven't had your growth spurt, that may be a whole different story. <laughs> if you're already into adulthood, I see no reason to put yourself or anyone else at risk of having that whole transplant procedure done uh, until you get closer to 5 to 10 EGFR. You may not want to wait below 5, which I generally recommend. If you can, if you're a younger person, you get good follow-up uh, with a kidney specialist, probably can wait till you get below 5. And that could be years of not being on a machine. Uh, but as far as preemptively getting a kidney transplant in the 18 range, um, personal view is I would wait. But I, I'm not a transplant expert, and I would go with your transplant doc. Very good. Marco asked, are statins for cholesterol good or bad for stage 4 with an EGFR of 24? Everybody that's got real CKD, your EGFR is below 60 or let's say below 45 consistently. You get, a, you get a higher risk of getting all those bad problems, with heart attacks and strokes. <coughs> and those cholesterol medicines will decrease your probability of getting one of those bad events that relate to hardening of the arteries. Those cholesterol drugs are just that. They decrease the amount of cholesterol, the atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries. So they are good drugs, and they should be used for everyone with real CKD, in my opinion. 
Yeah, just and, kind of and and and, and let me just, let me add one other thing. <coughs> a lot of doctors, for whatever reason, are not really up to date. <coughs> excuse me, on what level of bad cholesterol to shoot for. So you take a nose cholesterol drug. Your bad cholesterol is called LDL. I personally would like to shoot for a 60 to 70. And many docs are looking for 100 and above. Not, not good in my opinion. Take the right amount of those drugs to get you in that range. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, we did a show a couple months ago about the latest drugs. And we went over the ACEs, the ARBs, the SGLT2s, <laughs> talked about the statins and all that. And... You know, one of the big takeaways I had from it, besides I practically had medication in every category, um, was that so many of them have been shown to help slow the progression of kidney disease to reduce protein. And the only negative side effects I remember, and luckily it's not one that I've experienced, was ED was like every drug seemed to have that that I took as a potential side effect. Yeah, well, I mean, actually, um, other than a few, now I, I gave a whole talk on blood pressure medicines yep. and what the best blood pressure medicines were to take. And I refer you to that talk, but the, drug, the drugs of choice should not cause ED. The drugs, erectile dysfunction, the drugs that we talk about on this program to slow the decline of kidney function. The biggest problem, James, is certainly not ED. It's something that we've talked about many times. When you start an ACE or an R, mm. or you start an SGLT2, those, you know, the flozins, the flozin drugs, uh, and, and certainly when you start the aldosterone antagonists, the Nerino and so forth, um, you get what initially? In most cases? A drop yeah. in your GFR. Yeah. And, uh, and, and interestingly, James, uh, that's one of the papers I recently reviewed is about that topic. And that's a real phenomenon. And it turns out that if you got real kidney disease and your GFR drops initially, longer term, you're probably going to be much better off that these drugs are probably going to really be working for you. So these are the drugs that can slow the decline. Yep. Very good. Now, Valsa ask we've had a, a number of people ask about different protein to include in their diet and she asks are eggs okay any protein is fine there's nothing specific about any protein other than red meat not a good idea you want to try in general again this is for the hardening of the arteries you want to get your omega-3s you want to eat fish you want to eat we want to have lots of fruits and vegetables i mean these things will help you live longer. They've been shown to really affect your, your lifespan. But in terms of which particular proteins to eat with kidney disease, it doesn't really matter. It's not your kidney disease that makes a difference. Other than, as we talked about earlier, avoid that red meat, because uh, that probably is, has a relationship to losing kidney function. All right, so those are all the simple questions. I'm going to look through. There's a bunch that have, like, numbers and things like that. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll, <laughs> all right. Let me see what we got here. Uh, okay. So, 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 MY says, my doctor ordered a protein to creatinine ratio. Your doctor's not wrong. Uh, and your doctor's right. Uh, albumin is a protein. Okay. Uh, and no, no. Your doctor's fine, MY. Um but I think in general, so we all are on the same page as it's not, it's bad enough that you use different units in other countries. So we got, you know, the normal range is 30 to 300 in the U S and three to 30 outside the U S. So that's going to confuse people. And generally the nephrology community, the experts have gotten together to say, let's all agree that we're going to use one way of doing it. One way of measuring your kidney uh, function, EGFR, and there's, I'm not going to get into details of how that's done, but we're trying to standardize how we measure your kidney function and how we measure urine protein. So most of the experts are saying, let's all agree that we're going to do albumin and creatinine. Not, your doctor's not doing anything wrong for sure. Um, so uh, Mike the man, protein 50 to 200, 
low pressure, can I still take an ACE or an ARB? Okay, GFR of 65, 46 year old man. Well, first of all, 65 uh, is, um, you know, is, 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 is borderline, uh, not necessarily kidney disease. Uh, you're running 150 to 200, uh, that's protein in the urine. And um, that's, a, that's a tough one, uh, Mike the man. Um, I would say that I don't know how low your blood pressure is. Now, if your blood pressure gets too low, the ACE or, or the ARBs are going to hurt your kidneys. So I would say if you have low blood pressure, uh, you probably don't want to go on an ACE or an ARB. SGLT2 may be a better choice. Uh, but again, that can also lower blood pressure, but probably not as much. So there's, there's more choices these days, but that's, that's a tough one. I wouldn't push it because the low blood pressure may actually do more damage uh, to your kidneys. <clears throat> um, <coughs> Pedro <coughs> says, what is ACE or ARP for lower protein? Uh, James will give you the list of the drugs. Yep, they're in the description. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, these drugs have been around for decades, and they were the first drugs to show convincingly that they will slow decline of kidney function. And they were first used in diabetics with protein in the urine. And they are really good all around drugs for your heart, for your long term survival. So they are good drugs to lower urine protein and to decrease your risk of dying from heart disease. Uh, now, okay, uh, let's see here. So I, I see a lot of that advice TV. Is that your answer? Are you, That's me. You yeah. Responding oh, okay. back to people. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'm getting, I'm trying to see where, where okay. <clears throat> um, so Philip, how much protein were you leaking and how do you get it to stop? Uh, he was well, talking to me about when I was oh, okay, diagnosed. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, the, the Renadel, uh, I, listen, Ron and anyone else taking probiotics or taking supplements, use what has been studied. I know there's been attempts to study Renadel, and I know that some nephrologists have been involved. I don't know whether they have a conflict of interest in terms of, you know, the actual, uh, you know, getting benefits from selling the drug. Uh, but I would stay away from supplements uh, and probiotics. Uh, not, in other words, I don't have anything against them, but use what we know works. And we have many discussions about drugs that work and the new drugs that work. And I'll refer you to those talks. Um, Debbie says two plus protein. Uh, does it say on the blood work just two plus? What is the number? Okay, two plus protein, Debbie. Okay, generally one plus is about uh, 300. Two plus is definitely significant. Debbie, if you, significant, if you uh, consistently have two plus protein, uh, you definitely need to be on the drugs that we talk about to slow decline of kidney function. And, and listen to those talks. Um, but even better yet, get the albumin to creatinine test. Ask your doctor to get you an albumin to creatinine test. Um, Let's do one more, then we'll be out ahead. of time. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So somebody says they have, Sandy says he had stage two. Uh, now, you lost weight, that's great. You limit sodium, that's also great. Washing your diet, these are all great. But I don't know that you ever really had kidney disease, and that's neither here nor there without knowing what your protein in the urine is. Is that all we have time for, James? Yep, okay. that is all. Our hour went by so quick, and it was so informative and so helpful. Okay, um, let me, let me, let, yep. Sheila, I got to answer Sheila. Our doctor said 300 milligrams. ACR, albumin creatinine, is not significant. Sheila, I don't know where your doctor is getting that, but I would have to disagree. And you could tell your doctor that. And you could look up the, that's called macroalbumin, or that's called real protein in the urine. So Sheila, get that recheck and tell your doctor that I said 
that that's something that should be treated and you should be on some of the drugs that we've talked about to decrease your protein. Very good. All right, Doc, thank you so much. And this is the last scheduled show of 2023. Our last show of the year together. You'll be back in January of 2024. So I wish you, Doc, <laughs> and your wife, great holiday, you know, coming forward. I hope you guys get a lot of rest, have a lot of fun with family. And for everyone else out there, thank you so much for being here. Please give the video a thumbs up. Share them on social media. This is great information to help those out there who have kidney disease learn more about it. And the more we know, the better we can be at being proactive in our management of it. All right, Doc. It's been fantastic. And everybody else, I will see you all, most likely, in 2024, but I may do a couple like Saturday shows where I just jump on and have fun with everyone and answer questions. I'll, I'll probably get a couple of those in before the end of the year. So not likely that this is the last one of 2023, but everyone else have a great rest of the year, great holiday, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye everyone.